Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> today, uh, at the presentation about Agama, which is our project for some kind of next generation of Linux installer. It has some yeah, new features, dropping some old features, and so on. My name is Josef Reidinger. I work as developer for systems management and installation uh, group for uh, more than 15 years. So, yeah, long time. And uh, let's start with disclaimer. Anything I said is not official statement of our team or SUSE or whatever. Also, it's not final statement. If I say something we support or we don't support, doesn't mean it won't change because, yeah, still we are under heavy development. Uh, under, de under heavy development is also Agama. So things changed and we still don't have some final definition of requirements. So maybe it will change and also the stuff we support or don't support will change. When I talk about uh, web-based Anaconda, I mean the version from uh, Wednesday when I last tried. And yeah, I would like to note it's from Rawhide, so it's also under heavy development. And yeah, what I mentioned doesn't mean it's still true. And same for Agama. I download the latest staging uh, at yesterday night. And yeah, I already know that there is some fixes at uh, this lunchtime, but I don't have yet enough time to, to do it for demo, so demo will be from yesterday night. So yeah, still fresh enough, but yeah, not the latest greatest. And yeah, so what I will do is uh, basically give some overview what uh, what Agama do, what uh, is their architecture, what. Uh, it supports or tries to support. Then I will show the demo uh, in a virtual machine. And yeah, it will be, I will try to be honest. So I will also mention the, the issues we have, some, some bugs I, I discovered from yesterday's build and so on. And yeah, then I will talk what, what we plan and what we have uh, more like uh, long-term issues, not, not the some small bugs that can be fixed, but some, some challenges we have with new installer. Yeah, and I would like to mention, if you have any question, feel free to ask anytime, because yeah, usually, if you have memory like me, you will forget it already when will be end of presentation. So feel free to ask anytime, especially during demo, I can show some stuff more if you are interested in some parts. So, about overview. What's the goals? Uh, I would say the, the main goal of, of web UI is provide modern UI. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Probably some of you are old hackers and said, yeah, like I install Slackware, terminal is enough, I just put some, some commands and it will install my system or I will deploy some image. But uh, why it's important? If you ever read any release notes in Linux magazines, they always include screenshots. And usually there is like three or four screenshots of installer and one welcome screen. And that gives the first impressions. So, so it's like uh, if you read article about new release, you will see installer. And of course, if the installer looks ugly or old school, they will say, yeah, that, that looks, yeah, I have my Windows 12 or my Apple and it looks cool, and yeah, and now I see some anchors this UI, and yeah, yeah, people look scared about it, and probably even don't give try to, to distribution. Another goal we have is uh, to read the only necessary tasks in installer, because the old one tries to configure as much as possible from installer, but nowadays uh, the trends are more like uh, do it in your tool. And of course, installing, install environment is uh, kind of limited. For example, you prefer to manage your machine by, by for example, Salt or Ansible, or you prefer uh, edit your configuration to, uh, files by VI, or you have some, some different UI, or you have some external managing tool for your machine. And if you need to do it in installer, it's usually not familiar environment for you. So 
really the attempt is to install, uh, to set up only necessary stuff in the installer to be able to boot to your environment and then the rest of uh, setup do in this environment. Of course, the uh, so goal is to easy to install be easy to use. And uh, the hard part is everyone think it's something different for him. Easy to use. Yeah, some, some beginners that, uh, for example, comes from Windows or Apple, easy to use means don't ask me any strange word that I never heard of, like, yeah, what's LVM, right? What's partition? I don't, I never need to know about it. But for some advanced users, it's like, yeah, I, I want my RAID, I want my LVM, or I, I want, uh, yeah, yeah, advanced en uh, encryption for my uh, user. So it's really difficult to be easy to use for all users that, that use Linux distribution. And if, of course, the goal is also to be flexible because uh, installer nowadays, when there is more distributions, not just uh, for OpenSUSE or SUSE, even, even Fedora have silver blue, have distributions uh, that's stable, that's rolling, yeah, like Rawhide or stable releases. So uh, installer needs to be flexible to also fit to, to other uh, products or projects that's, uh, different, that has different requirements. Yeah, uh, one of big example for uh, need of flexibility is especially those new transactional distributions that's uh, quite strict on uh, how the partition looks like. But on the other hand, if you have a generic purpose uh, distribution, then you want to give the user the flexibility to, to pick whatever file system then they need. But if they have, for example, transactional ones in OpenSUSE, they need better FS with enabled snapshots. So it's like hard requirement. So install needs to reflect it and needs to be flexible. So how looks architecture of uh, Agama? Uh, I think last month we do switch uh, from Cockpit, uh, originally, Agama starts are as a Cockpit plugin. So it's basically Cockpit plugin that do some debug communication of, uh, to, to the backend parts. And uh, we move away from it. I will talk a bit more about it later. But uh, so how it looks. There's a client. Uh, currently, Agama has a command line interface, web based uh, front-end and HTTP uh, interface. That's the public ones. There's also some DBus communication on behind, but it's private one and it's not stable API. It's really for internal communication between uh, HTTP server and some parts that's still using uh, just, li uh, last, uh, just like library and it's written in Ruby, so the easiest way to communicate between Rust and Ruby for us is using Dbus. So uh, what's there? There is uh, the, the backend contain uh, HTTP API that also contain WebSocket. WebSocket is used for uh, sending events from backend when something changed or to report progress when installation happens. And uh, we also plan to use WebSocket for uh, terminal support. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, we also have auto installation, and that auto installation use command line interface. So, so basically, it's like an automated way how to call command line with some kind of profile. I will talk a bit more about automatic installation on the next slide. So, uh, what's, uh, what's the technologies that's used? As you can say, the, the oldest part is in, uh, in Ruby. Then there is a quite big Rust part that's contain HTTP server and yeah, yeah, providing sockets and also some parts of logic that uh, that's easy to uh, write from sketch uses Rust because Rust is yeah uh, quite fast and also has nice asynchronous environment unlike uh, Ruby and uh, for a web-based UI we use React and yeah it's basically we, because we start as cockpit plugin and cockpit is in React, so we use it. And for uh, 
web design, we use uh, the pattern fly components. Basically, goal is to, to look similar, for example, like cockpit. So, so people that manage their system with cockpit feel kind of similar. And now, why we move from cockpit when, when we want to look like cockpit? Uh, basically, the reason is uh, the size of dependency. Cockpit is quite a big project. They have a lot of dependencies, including Python. So uh, we will need to have uh, Ruby, Python, and uh, more stuff, and we try to reduce the installation environment. And we found that we don't use so many uh, uh, stuff from cockpit. Basically, what we use is a terminal, then uh, authentication, and uh, the, the third part we use is calling dbus. And yeah, we found that also dbus quiet uh, limited us. I will also talk a bit more about it at, uh, at the end, why, why we move from dbus to HTTP server API. So, uh, we, we found that we use that small part of cockpit, but it uh, brings a lot of dependencies that we don't need. Good. So, about automatic installation. What we currently support is uh, we have a JSON that's basically, it captures what users select in, in installer, and uh, you can, uh, exported via command line, what, what selected, for example, in web UI, it creates JSON, and that JSON can be used then for automatic installation. Another option for more dynamic profiles is JSONnet that uh, contains uh, LSHV, like hardware information. It's injected, and yeah, there's example on the right side. I hope uh, you can see something. Uh, basically, what this example did is it finds the biggest disk and mark this biggest disk as the primary one for a system and also select a product because what Agama can do is uh, install multiple products. So uh, on demo, I will also show that uh, we have the micro OS and Tumbleweed on one ISO and what uh, this uh, uh, second part, uh, second dynamic part to do is basically find how much memory the system has, and if it has less than eight gigabytes of memory, it will install microOS distribution, and if it has more, it will install Tumbleweed. So it's a, our way how to support, yeah, some, let's say, hardware-based, uh, uh, hardware-based automatic installation. What we also support, because automatic installation asset is just using command line interface, then to provide more flexibility to users and customers is to allow to just use shell script. They just directly core command line. And uh, why it can be useful is uh, if there is some tricky parts that need some, some additional configuration or uh, if there is some need for post-install uh, modification of system before reboot. Like, uh, for example, in SUSE we have some policy that all our servers need to have deployed uh, Velociraptor, which is some uh, security reporting software that yeah, basically tries to monitor that no one uh, yeah, hijack uh, our servers. Yeah, and it's a requirement that ideally it should be on all servers when they start running. So uh, I uh, create example, shell script that basically do the installation and before reboot, it will also install and configure Vel Velociraptor. So even during the first boot, it already start reporting what, what the server is doing. Yeah, and another part is we also have partial support for AutoS profiles and the uh, reason is quite simple. Users and customer hates when uh, we start breaking stuff that works for them for ages. So they have their AutoS profiles that can install, install machines. And in some cases, it's really big, do a lot of smart things. And yeah, it takes them time, and time is money, to adapt to new solutions. So we try to 
support as much as possible of old Autrust profiles that, that can be in Agama. So uh, customers just, just uh, pass their old profile and we, we try to get as much as possible from that profile and uh, respect it in installation. Yeah, and one interesting topic about automatic installation is also it's extending medium. Because uh, what, uh, what happens when you need to install multiple servers is that sometimes it, uh, it makes sense to just have your own ISO that's modified. For example, you can include on ISO the profile. And we're thinking how to extend the medium and on the other hand try to uh, not allow customers to break the, the, the medium. Currently we use hybrid ISO and one nice thing about hybrid ISO is that there is a small space at the start of, the, of that ISO that's, that's ignored. And what uh, you can do is to create the partition table at that first place. And then after the start of, uh, uh, at the end of the ISO, having some extended space. So, so our plans, basically currently it's not yet done, but our plans is to create a partition behind that ISO, yeah. Be behind that ISO, and in that partition, the customers can load their stuff, like their profile, so they basically uh, extend the ISO, and when we boot, boot the system, we will search for that additional partitions, mount it, and search for the additional files, like that profiles. So basically, it, they still have the ISO, the, the original content uh, of installer is there, and there will be additional partition which we use for loading those stuff. Now it's time for demo, and yeah, time's running like crazy. So, this one. Yeah, yeah. You can see here Agama. Actually, here, I have to admit, i slightly cheating because this is not the first screen. First screen is the product selection where you can select Tumbleweed and MicroOS. And the reason why I do it, I will talk about it, is uh, that uh, slow software stack. And it means for Tumbleweed, we have like, uh, over 50,000 of packages. And uh, when you select the distribution, it will load the repositories. And repositories contain a lot of metadata including description of all packages and so on, and it takes some time to load it. So, so to skip this part, I will already press select Tumbleweed. So this is the uh, original screen. Usually, if you have big enough uh, disk space, you won't see this storage part. I will talk a bit more about it when, when I fix this part. And the second part says, that uh, you need to define how the user can log into the machine. Because by default, there is no, uh, no predefined root password, no user, or you can define uh, SSH publicly for root. So basically, you have no way how to log in into the system. So you need to set up. So let's start with the simple one, which is users. So I open users. I will just set a root password. But uh, either of those options are valid. So either define the first user or password or you can upload the SSH key. <coughs> yeah, so password is set and when I get to overview, I will see that just storage has some problems and let's look what happens. Now it's loading and yeah. Storage proposal not possible, and why it's not possible is because I have 10 gigabytes uh, system, uh, 10 gigabytes disk, but uh, Tumbleweed by default uses uh, BitRFS with snapshots and define that it needs at least 17 and a half gigabyte and swap partition. So what I can do, I can change installation device. It by default take the first disk that's used for booting but we can select different disk. So either you can select this or you can create even the volume group. So I can create the volume group from two disks, like those two. 
Yeah, and when I do it, they already create a proposal. You can check the actions. You, you, you see the overview, what happens, uh, how it will look like. That yeah, you have the first disk, which is booting, so it needs uh, for legacy booting some boot partition, and it creates LVM on it. And on those LVM, it creates uh, some root with some size and swap. You can also see what what actions really happens. So it deletes some some old partition, delete partition table on the first disk. <laughs> Yeah, create partition tables on, on both disks and create those partitions and yeah, some, some, some volumes. So you can really see what will happen when, when you do installation. And you can see that, for example, the second disk is not touched at all. Yeah? Question? So is this, this modifiable? Let's say that I want to use, I don't know, only half of the third disk. Good question. I will repeat it. Uh, the question is if, there, if, if it's modifiable, if I can just use the half of the third disk, it's modifiable, and I will show it how. So now we have those parts, and this is about installation device. And then there is, you can enable encryption, that's uh, one thing. And how to manage better which space will be used is the section that about finding space. Uh, just note this part probably of storage. The, the features probably won't change much, but uh, some UI representation probably change. So you can see you have there two disks, and you see how it is, and you see, for example, that there is X partition, and currently it's set that uh, space is fine by deleting all current content. But another useful thing is shrinking. You can allow shrink shrinking, and it will Shrink basically means it keep the data on the partition, but shrink the partition and uh, eats some free space. This partition is almost empty, so you can see that uh, it has yeah, almost two gigabytes, and it can yeah almost use 1.9 gigabyte from it. So that's about resizing. The third option is use only the available space. Uh, so it means don't modify any existing partitions. I would say that shrinking is especially useful if you have a notebook with preload windows and want to keep them, then uh, often the users want to just uh, shrink their windows and have multi-boot. And the last one is custom, and it's when there is more content, you can specify for each partition what you want to do, like keep it or delete it or resize it, so you can select based on partitions. Okay, so let's go back. And if you want to uh, define better what partitions you need, like yeah, if you don't like, for example, that BTRFS. So now it's configured to use transactional system. Uh, BTRFS is snapshot. If I disable it, it will stop using snapshots. And now you can see that immediately BTRFS is much smaller. So I see that Tumbleweed needs at least uh, five gigabytes of space. And yeah, if I want separate home. And uh, yeah, it uh, used the defaults defined by Tumbleweed. Basically, each product can define that uh, it's also for Tumbleweed. Like if there is at least 30 gigabytes of space, also propose separate home. In this case, it's not true because the original disk is smaller. But there are some predefined values, like for Tumbleweed, the preferred uh, type system, uh, the file system for homes are XFS. So it uses XFS. Then you can define the range if you want. Say like, yeah, I want my home to be at least 10 gigabytes uh, of size, or if you want to be yeah strict, like yeah, I, I want to have it in fixed size. And range can be. It's useful, for example, for a system. If you have, uh, if you want uh, that your root file system should be between 15 and 30 gigabytes, you can specify it here, and the proposal calculates with it and, and count it. It's uh, really useful for, for, uh, for automatic uh, installation because you don't know how many disks will be there, so you can play how your uh, partition plan should look like. And the uh, result is that it will be uh, export it to your JSON and then used for automatic installation. So we'll count. 
I hope it answers your question. Basically, it, currently you cannot say I want to use half of the disk, but what you can do if, yeah, that's one bug. I can show it if you, for example, don't have LVM but have uh, ju just use uh, some disk. You can specify where you want exact partition. It's by using change location, and you can specify even to VDB where you want it. Currently, in yesterday's build, there's a bug that uh, it's in UI that uh, doesn't pass some value correctly, but you can specify, for example, on the second disk, I have some installation, so you can specify I want to have it here. Yeah, and again, yeah, you specify format, or you can even mount the file system, so you can reuse some old home file system. As said, this UI is probably not final. Yeah, so this is about storage, and just quickly go to others. There's localization, you can change time zone, keyboard, language. For network, it uses network manager as backend, so you can even connect to Wi-Fi. I won't show you the, the current Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, question? Will you, will, will you be able to Yeah, uh, question is if 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 there is uh, if there is multi disk BTRFS RAID possible in install, right? Yes. Yeah, I am not the storage expert, so I know we kind of support the BTRFS over whole disk, but about the RAIDs in BTRFS, I am not so sure. So yeah, I can forward your question. I think, I think there are some plans to work on it, uh, but currently I'm not sure if it's uh, currently supported. So, yeah, that's answer. Yeah, so uh, even you can install via Wi-Fi. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Uh, I will repeat it. Uh, it's what's used for backend for that storage actions. There is a library called lib storage that's used even in old installer. It's for uh, creating the device graphs. And what, what it can do is, uh, it can compute the actions between them. But uh, the, the part that's doing the proposal based on some requirements is uh, part of the YAST. So, so it's written in Ruby. And it's doing that computation. So it basically cre uh, creates the new device graph so that library then computes the, uh, if you see that plant actions, it's from that, uh, from that library that it takes basically probe device graph and uh, plant device graph and see what actions they need to do it. Like, yeah, delete those partition tables, create new ones, shrink this, shrink this partition, and, and so on. So that's, that's the technology it uses. Good. Yeah, so networking, uh, basically it has power of network manager and it will keep the settings on target system. So if you co uh, connect here to Wi-Fi, it will be remembered uh, on installed system. Yeah, storage is already shown. And uh, how it looks uh, software? It's different than on old Instar because it allows basically playing its full, full uh, package manager that can play with a single packages. Here it's based on patterns. And basically, it's not all patterns. It's preselected list of patterns that's defined by each product. That uh, yeah. So basically, it's what what the distribution wants to provide. And here is probably the most interesting. Yeah, selecting the GNOME, KD, XFT, and you select it, and you have environment. And you can even select multiple of them. Good. And yeah, users, you already see. And just to show how it looks, that original one, you can. That's the initial screen where you can select uh, if you want Tumbleweed or, or MicroOS. So basically, product you want to install. And if you select MicroOS, you, for example, cannot change the, the, uh, the file system of root because it's required to have, to have BTRFS with snapshots. And also, the partition is different because it, by default, proposes separate var, which is intended for Docker images and virtual machines. So. As time's flying, I need to ooh, go, yeah. So what do we have issue? Yeah. So 
let's just quickly go to the rest. So issues are set, slow. Software stack, also no clear requirements. No one said, we, need a, we really need this and we don't need this. It's like, yeah, maybe I think it, it will be useful to have something like this. So no clear requirements. And also not enough feedback yet. And yeah, we still don't have it in OpenSUSE. So yeah, just quick slide what we learned. We tried also some other browsers. It runs Firefox, we tried other browsers. Also we play with Valent compositors and yeah, nothing works well for us. Yeah, probably other parts we can discuss on the, on the, uh, on the OpenSUSE booth because yeah, not enough time. And plans is basically, we plan the section about security because it's important to have a system secure from the first boot. Integration to OpenSUSE, that's basically plan in next, uh, uh, in, in two weeks, there will be conference in Norberg, OpenSUSE conference, and yeah, we discuss what will be needed to integrate it in OpenSUSE products. We also plan to improve a bit auto installation, and yeah, try to collect feedback, and of course, some polishing, because there are still some rough edges and how, to, how you can contact us. We have a booth of OpenSUSE, booth at conference, you can find me there. So yeah, feel free to ask or play more with Demo. I will have my notebook with Demo there. So yeah, try to break it. I find at least three bucks. So yeah, we can take it as challenge and find more. Uh, we have on GitHub, uh, source codes. There's also discussions and uh, issues. So feel free to discuss stuff or report Anything you find, we have IRC and mailing list. Good, so any final questions? Uh, do you have a session for managing and the firewall You mean uh, many, uh, like security for firewall and SSH? Yeah, I, I, I will. Yeah, I will, I will repeat a question. Uh, if we plan to have section that will allow uh, SSH in firewall, ba basically it's all in, in old installer that will uh, basically pre uh, predefine the setup for SSH so you can immediately connect uh, through SSH to the target machine. I think that will be part of that planned security section because yeah, it's not about SSH uh, sometimes you need to open other parts. Someone prefers, for example, using VNC for, for managing machines. So I think it will be part of that, uh, of that security section. Yeah, Marco? Cool. Uh, I have two questions. If you, uh, the, the first, uh, first question, when you choose C-Micro or Humble, if you change, I hope it caches uh, the repos downloaded Good, I will repeat uh, both questions. The first question is uh, about initial screen. If, you, if we switch from Tumbleweed to Micro, if it uh, keeps the, the repository cache. And the second question is what uh, settings change when we switch, if it remembers something or use from scratch. So I will start with the second one. It will start basically almost from scratch because it's so different products. It has different patterns, it has different storage requirements. So, so basically, it's like starting from scratch. That's also why it's initial screen. Usually, you will select product and then want to configure it. It's, it's not so common that, yeah, you do all configuration and set, yeah, maybe I will do something else. That's, yeah, basically, you need to start from scratch and that's because usually the distros are so different. It's not like, yeah, one use KD just, or GNOME and, and the rest is the same. And uh, the second question, or the first one that you ask, is about caches. Uh, we plan to look into it. Currently, we don't do it. We also cleaning cache because also the memory constraints, because the caches are quite big. So our plan is basically to start doing it. Yeah, and we start running out of the time. So if we have more questions, feel free to come to the booth and we can discuss it. So thanks for. Uh, attending and yeah, see you at the booth.